Hey, and welcome to this edition of the What's Next Live. And I am so thrilled. I think, Liz, you're my first guest ever to be on my show three times. Three like, times, yeah. How lucky am I? And twice on a LinkedIn Live. So I know I'm super excited to talk to you. But before we jump in, I'm just going to give a little bit of background of who you are, Liz. Not that people listening wouldn't have any idea because that would be hard to believe. But Liz Wiseman is a researcher and executive advisor who teaches leadership to executives around the world. She's the author of the New York Times bestseller, Multipliers, which by the way, is one of my favorite books of all time, The Multiplier Effect, and Wall Street Journal bestseller, Rookie Smarts and Impact Players. She's also part of the Thinkers 50 group, which I am as well. And she's been an amazing resource for me as I've gotten through my second book. So thank you, my friend, for joining me again. <laughs> Well, bravo. Congratulations on your second book. And I had a chance to read it and I, I felt like I gained so much reading it. So thank you. Like it's, it like, you know, can I just like start by describing what I think your new book does so well? Okay. Uh Oh, let's go. <laughs> well, I feel like a lot of managers are treating growth like they're bowling and there's a bowling split. And like, I've got my customer satisfaction over here, my employee satisfaction, I have to do both, but it's like bowling a split. And they kind of roll the ball right down the middle, trying to split the difference or hit one, but not the other. And I think what your book does so well is it basically puts the employee experience as the head pin. And it's like, you knock this down and just everything else follows and boom, like an explosive strike. That's That was kind of the metaphor that come, kept coming through. Well, I'll the take book. it. So the name of the book is Experience Mindset. You can pre-order now. It's not coming out till June, but you know, and and Liz uh, was so kind enough to also give me a blurb for the book too. So I'm super lucky and and blessed. Um, but let's start this interview. Let's start this conversation. I always try to begin with something I call bullish and bearish. Bullish, you're for it. Bearish, you're against it. Nothing too painful. Are you ready? Okay. Are you ready? All right. Bullish or bearish? Chat GPT. Are you bullish or bearish about it? Uh, bullish. Okay. Stepping All right. Stone to something more valuable than what it does today. Okay. Good. Next one. A having a lunch meeting in space. Bullish or bearish? <laughs> bearish. Oh no, you wouldn't do it. If someone said, Liz, I'm going to take the entire executive team to space for a meeting. You wouldn't go. It just seems like sitting on an airplane for a really long time. You know, <laughs> I don't know. All right, bearish. All right, the next one, virtual reality for coaching. Bullish. All right, great. Well, not too painful. Hopefully that was okay. <laughs> All right, well, we're going to start this. Uh, the whole concept and why I wanted to have you back on is, you know, sort of the beginning of 2023, there's a lot of uncertainty. There's a lot of ambiguity. There's a lot of, um, I guess, some people feel almost a lack of control of sort of what they're dealing with. And I think who better to come on and have this conversation than you, Liz. So let's start, let's start at the top. You know, what are you hearing um, around this whole beginning of the year and, and what's sort of facing us ahead, you know, as it relates to business growth, um, you know, attracting talent, you know, leadership. I mean, there's so many directions we could go, but, but you're talking to so many uh, executives where, where should we begin? Well, the word that I hear from executives over and over from all the clients and the organizations I um, I visit and work with is the, the headwinds is the word that is used over and over, which is we need to focus. We need to focus on the basics. We need like collaboration and inclusion, all that, but we need high performance and we're doing it in economically challenging times. I think executives are very much focused on the basics. Um, to try to navigate that. And I think now's a pretty confusing time for contributors. Um, it, like if I were to do a meme for like the environment today, particularly around the layoffs and tech and all of the uncertainty, like what will cascade and follow as a result of that is I would, um, oh, maybe take the scene out of The Wizard of Oz where Dorothy says, Toto, I don't think we're in Kansas anymore. And I feel like there's a lot of people right now saying, um, I don't, Toto, like, I don't think we're in 2021 anymore. Like <laughs> we were in a very different environment with different expectations. And in many ways, the balance of power 
in the employment um, contract is is changing. And that always happens after layoffs. And I think now is a time for people to be thinking, how do I navigate uncertainty and ambiguity? And how do I show up and contribute and create value? Which is really how you navigate ambiguity and uncertainty to a great extent. But that that's kind of what I'm seeing. And, you know, I, I often hear that let's get back to basics. Let's focus on the basics. Let's um, uncover where we're not doing a good job, if you will, on the basics. And, and I feel, and I definitely hear this is, I feel like the gap between what executives think is happening in the business and what's actually happening in the business, like, you know, the feet on the street, if you will, those that are meeting with customers or designing products, whatever their role is, has gotten so much wider that the basics sometimes are not aligned to what is most needed mm. within the business. Um, and so how do you determine or how do you advise executives um, and people listening? Because I think that all of us are trying to streamline what we're doing and add value and be more effective and efficient during this time. How do you uncover what the basics are, not only for your role, but for your business? Well, I would think about it, you know, you can look at back to basics as, you know, blocking and tackling of, you know, uh, ensuring profitability, getting products off the door, revving launch. But I think there's a different way to look at basics, and that is to look at basic needs. And I know we're seeing a lot of companies um, shed parts of their business that are speculative, like, okay, well, I'm not going to mention any of them because I'll probably offend somebody who's <laughs> been like their life's work has been to building these kind of speculative capabilities and innovations and products. And they're saying like, let's focus on things that are needed in the market today. And, you know, I, this is, this is kind of the mentality we need inside of the organization. When I studied the most impactful contributors, what I found is that like kind of fundamentally, these were people, and, you know, people who senior leaders describe as extraordinarily valuable, impactful, influential inside organizations and industries. These are people who don't just do their job. These are people who do the job that needs to be done. Emphasis on the word need. <laughs> needs, which means they are people who are heat seeking. Like, what is it that people need right now? Um, you know, they, they look out at their, so instead of having this inward orientation, they have an outward orientation. And in, in times of uncertainty, it's so easy to contract and to pull inward, like, What's my role in this? What's happening to me? What do I want? Am I getting what I want? And I think the most impactful people turn outward, which is what is it that the organization needs? What does the market need? What does my boss need? What do the senior executives need? What are my stakeholders, my collaborators, my clients? What is it that they need? And how do I go and fulfill that need? So it's turning outward and looking kind of like, what are the needs on the surface? And then what are the needs under the surface, like not just what are hot projects, hot commodities in the market, what are what are hot buttons? Um, you know, what are hot issues? And then pointing ourselves entirely toward where there's heat. Well, and I think what I love most about when you talk about this focusing um, on this kind of job that needs and a big bold on needs to be done is that these impact players, right? They change, they change their perspective and perceive situations from others' point, other people's point of view, not just their own, which means they're constantly sort of learning and adapting, where that kind of beginner's mind, right, versus that mm -hmm. sort of expert's mind of I know how to do this, I'm not looking for any <laughs> external input, I'm just going to go do it because it's always worked for me, or this is the way we've always done it. Um, you know, whether it's a growth mindset, fixed mindset, if you want to go Carol's route, like it doesn't matter, like, but mm -hmm. same sort of flow through thinking. And some, I believe, are not comfortable with that. I need to go ask and, and, and uncover what might be my blind spot, right? Or where right. the quote, the need is. And so if they're listening to this and, and they're going, yes, I want to be one of those impact players, but I don't know who to go to, to ask, to get that external perspective. And I don't know how to ask to get that external perspective. What would you, what would you say to those people? Well, I, you know, I think of it as like the most impactful people have a, like a, 
a multi angle view of a situation. Like they just can see things from more pointed, um, more angles. And I'm, I was struck recently. Um, uh, my my brother in law is a movie director, and uh, he's filming a movie in Prague. Ballerina plug for his movie. I don't think it's going to need a plug. It's got Ana de Armas in it. But anyway, I was there on set and having dinner with him, and and he was like mapping out the next day shoot, and he was describing what he does as a director to get ready for every single day's shoot. So they, you know, they get done filming, they look at the dailies and then he's like mapping out, okay, here's what we're shooting tomorrow. And here are the angles that I want. And that's his job as a director is like, okay, I want this angle. I want like a wide angle here. I want a far. And, you know, part of the battle with the producers is how do I get as many cameras in this room as possible? And usually rich film has multiple multiple cameras. You're not watching it from a single angle. And the director has this ability to like look at close up, go far away, wide shot, you know, direct shot. And then the editors can pull that together. This is, for me is a very much a metaphor of, you know, when we go into a situation fraught with ambiguity where we're not sure what happens, like how do you get as many cameras in that room as possible? So how do you see it from, how do you see a, a problem, a situation, something that is fraught with ambiguity and uncertainty? You know, naturally we see our own angle, our own camera, which is I have this direct line to this, but how do you get your boss's angle on this? How do you get your client's angle, your senior executives, your collaborators, maybe your nemesis in the organization? And when we can gather that footage, then it becomes so clear what we need to do with it. Because what we're gathering when we see other people's angle on something is, well, what do they need from this? Like, what's a win for them? How do I create value for them? And, and that gives us this clear picture, which helps us move toward it. Like, it's hard to change without a compelling reason to do something differently. But when we start to get this rich picture of what needs to happen to navigate uncertainty and, and what value looks like, then it's easier to move toward it because we can move toward it with confidence. Well, and I think what, what's highlighted for that, I mean, I'm going to try to create correlation here on your work. So hopefully I'll do it justice. But if you are listening and you go, yes, some of it is as managers, we have to hire for that kind of mindset and behavior versus this tried and true, um, I think, misnomer, by the way, of this cultural fit, right? Hiring for cultural fit, right? Versus hiring for mindset and behavior. And so cultural fit may be fixed mindset. I'm just using that as a drastic example, mm -hmm. right? Virtu versus hiring for somebody who um, has that mindset of I'm going to approach it from multiple positions with lots of different lenses. I like talking to lots of people and getting input and hearing and listening for those kinds of behaviors from someone versus, well, this is the way I did it. And I'm sure it will work again. <laughs> you know, and, and, you know, and cultural fit is so important for people to be successful in an organization, but people don't have to start out as a strong cultural fit. Like there's a lot of research that shows that people um, adapt and figure out like what you want is not someone who fits the culture. You want someone who can decode the culture. And, and really that requires an outward orientation and an outward orientation really requires confidence. You know, I, my buddy um, at Oracle and I were sitting around uh, years ago talking about like, what's the most important thing to hire for. And I remember this was Ben Putterman, who's now at Rivian. He said, you know, Liz, I think more than anything, you hire for confidence. And I really think the more I understand kind of the mindsets of the best leaders, you know, this the thing I explored in multipliers is that you want leaders who are confident in their own intelligence and capability. So much so that they don't have to come to work every day trying to prove they're the smartest person in the world. And they end up acting like a jackass, you know, inside right. the organization. You want someone who's like, I'm brilliant. I'm great at what I do. I'm smart. I'm talented. I'm gorgeous, whatever it is. And I'm over it. And so I can spend my time looking at the people on my team, trying to understand what are they good at and how do I 
get them engaged and deploy them in the right kinds of ways. And I think very similarly, when we hire talent on our teams, we want people who are confident enough in their own um, abilities, the own value that they contribute, and like secure enough that they can spend their time not trying to prove their value, but understanding what value looks like to the people around them and then going after that. Like, how do I create value elsewhere? And having that confidence, and I don't mean arrogance. I think my guess is everyone knows the difference between arrogance and confidence. But in many ways, like the, the sweet spot for innovation and growth is you want people who are self-confident, composed, calm, but situationally um, lacking confidence, meaning, well, I've never done this before. Like, okay, my boss, Tiffany, she's got me in this like area. I've never done this before. Maybe I should go ask some people, what are they, like, I shouldn't just assume. And so when we have low situation confidence, but very high self-confidence, learning happens, innovation happens, growth happens, value is created. Yeah. And I, and I couldn't agree more. I gave an interview many, many years ago and I said, don't, um, don't confuse my confidence um, for arrogance. Right. <laughs> so uh, that very example, right. That I, I crave impact. You know, I, I want to sort of deliver value. I want to help others deliver value, right. And uncovering those things. And I think that um, there's no hidden agenda. It's just, the goal is let's have impact. I can't do it alone. Let's do it together. And how do we do that? Yeah. And it really, that confidence creates an outward orientation. And that's the thing that I really want to emphasize from what I found in my research is the best leaders have an outward orientation and the most impactful, influential contributors have an outward orientation, which it seems like it might be inward. It's like, this is me. This is what I'm passionate about. This is what I want to do. And that creates influence. It's actually having our eyes outward. And when we do that, it ends up helping us navigate that uncertainty because we, we see, we see needs, we see opportunities to create value. And that's what helps us go toward it. You know, what I found kind of another like core difference between sort of the ordinary rock solid contributor and the impact player is that when the situations are fraught with ambiguity and uncertainty, impact players move toward them when other people move away from them. And it, you know, for me, the metaphor here is, is a wave. Like, you know, and you grew up in Hawaii, Tiffany. So, you know, you've had that, we, I, we probably all had that um, experience of standing in the surf, like, and a big wave is coming and it feels too big, too powerful, like too big for us. And we, we have to decide, what do we do? Do we, do we follow my instincts, which are to turn my back and run and get back to shore? And inevitably I get tossed and tumbled in the surf and I, you know, get myself up just in time to like be slammed by another wave. And so many people go through the workplace like this, just slammed by things that seem scary and ambiguous and uncertain. But the most impactful people handle those waves like surfers. They don't just stand there and let the wave toss them, they dive into it and, and through it, you know, or duck dive like a surfer does. And, and it's like harnessing the power of that uncertainty and they move toward it. And, you know, so in some ways it's like have an outward orientation to really be able to see the need. And then when you encounter that uncertainty, just like step into it rather than away from it, it tends to produce a better result for us. You have five sort of everyday challenges that impact players handle differently. Mm. So one is messy problems, two, unclear roles, three, unforeseen obstacles, four, moving targets like the wave, five, unrelenting demands. So if you're listening to this and you're like, oh my God, <laughs> like all five of those, like messy like problems, life. unclear, right? Like I turn around and I'd start running, right? And so... I don't know if I could do one of them or two of them, but but in your mind, um, these impact players are the ones that managers go to in critical situations because they're able to handle those five things sometimes simultaneously in this kind of ambidextrous way, right? Where they're like, I am handling two things at once. I'm focusing here. And it's not about um, 
you know, multitasking as much as it is being able to focus where you're going to have that value. And so that can be overwhelming for people. You know, those five, like I don't do well in unclear roles. Like I like very defined roles or I might not like unforeseen obstacles. I didn't know it was coming. Now I don't know how to deal with it or moving targets. Tell me where you want me to go. And that's where I'm going to go. Right. I mean, so people kind of have that mindset um, uh, of not being flexible through those five. And so right. what do you do to say, I, I want to try to be, you're not, maybe not going to be excellent at all of them, but how do I become better at them? Yeah. Well, I think there are, all of those are messy, uncertain, ambiguous, moving, can't find my balance place kinds of situations are all situations without a playbook. And they're all situations where we have to take charge of them. But that's scary. And so I think like there's a way to de-risk all of those situations. You know, if you have this messy problem and it requires you to kind of like step out of the confines of your job and go do the job that needs to be done. Like, don't do it without telling someone, you know what, there's this thing over here. And I think that's a higher priority. I'm going to go over here, but don't worry. I haven't abandoned my post or, Hey, can you cover this while I go deal with this? Um, when roles are unclear, the most impactful people, they step up and they take charge, but taking charge of a group of your peers, without any authority, like nobody asked you to do it, that's socially risky. But you can de-risk that situation by, let's say you're in a, a leaderless meeting, bunch of you know smart people there collaborating, but it's unclear who's in charge. Well, you don't wanna just take over. You can say, would it be helpful if I led this conversation? Like, okay, who here is in charge? Okay, would it be helpful if I kind of went to the board and led us through this conversation? Or I'd be willing to take the lead on this, but I don't necessarily want to be like, I don't need to be in charge of it forever, but I will get us like through the launch of this. And then I'd love to have somebody else take over. Like we can gain permission and support for our leadership. Um, you know, when targets are moving, you feel like, man, I just was given this goal. And now I've like got to point myself at a new goal. You know, we can go in and say, okay, it seems like this thing I'm working on is no longer most relevant like, would it be okay if I kind of like stopped this project and started this instead? Most managers are like, yes, exactly. Like, that's what's relevant. Or, hey, you know what? Seems like we need to be doing something different. Means I've got to go learn a bunch of new things. I'm going to be a little wobbly at first at this. But I'm willing to go do that. But like, forgive me for the next, you know, three weeks while I'm um, learning how to do this. Like, all of these are ways that we can de-risk an ambiguous situation. Well, you you say that one of, one of the things you say in uh, Impact Players is we can under contribute by over contributing. We can deliver too little value while working extremely hard. I think that that is so profound, right? Because some people think I'm working hard, doing a lot of stuff. I must be contributing a lot of things. And I, I think this is one of those misunderstood realities. So if you have those sort of five things that we deal with, don't think just over contributing in each one is going to make you more valuable to your team, to your manager, to your company. Well, this is what was shocking when I did this research comparing the impact players versus rock solid, ordinary contributors. And here's the profile of the rock solid, ordinary contributor is they're doing their job. They're smart. They're capable. They're hardworking. They're focused. They stick with things. They, you know, they play nice on teams. They carry their weight, but often they're working hard, but missing the opportunity to contribute because their head is down, doing their job, <clears throat> focused on what they signed up to do, what they want to do. Sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> Sometimes. Um, whereas the impact players are operating sort of heads up, paying attention to what's happening around them, going where there's hot, hot projects, you know, where, where there's heat in organizations. But again, it's all stuff that we can de-risk. I mean, I remember this one experience I had at Oracle where I was in charge of this leadership development program. We were bringing in our top executives from around the world and it was pretty straightforward. We we're going to share the strategy, give them some leadership skills, give them this little action learning project, which was to optimize Oracle's 
revenue and profits and success in these four critical accounts, big global accounts. We brought in all the global account managers. We spent a lot of money profiling these four accounts. And we were doing this action learning project where these 30 executives would look at these accounts and figure out how do we optimize our presence there. And it was a five-day program. And on uh, day four, the group's like, yeah, we don't think like we don't want to work on this, these four accounts. We actually think we have some a more important piece of work to do. We want to help the executives see that our strategy is like flawed. And they're like, we want to work on that instead. <laughs> and the president and the chief financial officer and the chief technology officer are coming the next day for the report out on this piece of work they're supposed to be doing. And I'm there having to make a decision. Do I let them kind of foment a mutiny <laughs> and tell the emperor they have no clothes on and that their strategy is bad? Or do I put them back to work on the planned piece of work? And I decided to actually, they had um, a case to be made and that maybe the most important thing for them to do was to critique the strategy. But I didn't just let them take over this program and then surprise the executives the next day who were coming for a report on our four biggest accounts, I'm like, okay, George, you go lead the team, but you come back with something compelling and brilliant. You do your work. You stay up all night if you need to, but don't disappoint yourself. Don't disappoint me and don't disappoint the president. And then I called the president. I called all of them at home and said, here's what to expect. I've made this decision. Here's why I think, they were shocked. Here's why I think, this is valuable and why I think we should do it and have an open mind. And I kind of walked them through why, walked them through what I wanted them to do behaviorally when they showed up. And it was this turning point for, for Oracle. And it was a turning point for me. But again, it was ambiguous, but I de-risked it. Well, you, you found in the research, uh, just to sort of put some wood behind this arrow, because we've been talking a lot about the impact of these of these impact players. Uh, an impact player's contribution is 3.5 times greater than the ordinary contributor's contribution. So when you're thinking, why am I not getting this promotion or why am I not getting pulled aside to run a project or why am I not tapped to do some special project or why do people not listen to my ideas or whatever the case might be? Why am I not getting up to bat? Like put yeah. me in coach. Yeah, put me in coach. Um, what are the things you can do to help create that uh, multiplier effect, um, to use a play on, on both of Liz's books, um, in order to become that impact player, right? The further you can do it, right, it's this multiplier of you get good at one thing, you get good at the next thing, you get the, all of a sudden, all those things are humming, right? You're looking externally, you're able to be self-aware, you can rally the team, you're getting pulled into projects, you're getting put into the up at bat, you're getting all of those, all of a sudden, your multiplied value is 3.5x, <laughs> right? Which is a measure, a, a, a meaningful, and something that gets you to be that go-to person for your leadership. Mm. Well, if you want to be that go-to person and have that kind of value, three and a half X ascribed to you and your work and get the opportunities that that presents is number one, you want to be self-managing. Um, you know, we don't have time to go into all the details, but when I looked at what managers really value and all the behavior of what they value people, they really value people who, figure out what needs to be done, do it, don't ask for permission. They just make things happen. And my conclusion is I step back from this and like, oh, managers don't really like managing. <laughs> Even managers don't like managers. And, but it's actually the right time for this because most people don't want to be managed. They want to be able to manage themselves and they appreciate some good leadership, but be self-managing, which means being able to figure out where to point yourself and do things before you're asked, get them all the way done, you know, be self-managing, but also help your leaders manage uncertainty. You know, well, I, I, I think that, that this has just been an amazing conversation at the beginning of the year. It's one of those things that hopefully people will re-listen to this interview. Um, I'm going to put it back out as a podcast as well, but really trying to shape 
your impact, your value, identifying sort of what your superpowers are, you know, getting permission for that autonomy along with the being managed, because it is a hybrid of the two. It's not like you could just be autonomous in a perfect world. It's earned autonomy. Yeah, definitely earned autonomy. When you're pointing yourself at the right things, um, you've earned the right to self-manage. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, I often get asked uh, that people from the outside will be like, oh, you have such a dream job. And I would say, yes, <laughs> yes. And? Tremendous amount of autonomy, right? A tremendous amount of earned autonomy, but still autonomy, but yet still held accountable for certain things. But not if I look back 20 years ago or even longer, you know, how I was managed then versus how I'm managed now is night and day. I mean, it's not even on the same playing field, right? I mean, it's just completely different. Um, but uh, it took me work of doing all these things we've been talking about, right? Identifying, understanding, um, and, and then just showing up. So with that, Liz, you know, again, I'm just grateful for your friendship. Um, I, I am so thankful that whenever I reach out, you always respond, which is just, uh, which is just amazing. But with the final last words uh, that you would leave to our listeners, how they can keep track with uh, your work um, and what you're doing and how they can continue to follow um, your wise wisdom? Well, all of my work really is around how do we create organizations where people are deeply utilized, where people can contribute at their fullest and then experience something that is exhilarating, not exhausting. That is what we're after. What, is, what do leaders need to do? What do contributors need to do to make that happen? Um, boy, you can find me a lot of places. The Wiseman Group is a good, wisemangroup.com is a good portal uh, to that. But you can find me on LinkedIn and um, Twitter. I'm easy. All right. Well, last question. Unexpected. I didn't ask you ahead of time. Is there another book in the works? You know, I've got three books that are up here that um, need to be manifest. And I'm trying to figure out which of the three to do, but yeah, no, I've got, I've got more books coming. Amazing. Exciting. I can't wait. Can't wait to read it. Well, to everybody who joined us today on this uh, LinkedIn uh, what's next live. Thank you for joining us. Thank you to Liz for being such an amazing third time guest which is she's in air all by herself. Um, but thank you everybody for listening. Have a great rest of your day and we'll see you next time. Thank you.